All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm actually really excited to see all of the people in the room, but at the same time, I'm actually really disappointed because when I submitted my paper for this, I was really expecting everybody's already doing continuous integration. Everybody's already con doing continuous delivery. They've already have it all figured out. I'm going to have three people who are in the Stone Age who don't know how to do it. So um, this session is... Uh, brought to you by GitHub, and one of the things that uh, I like to go out and talk to customers about is understanding what a full life cycle could look like using tools that exist both in the cloud and on premise. And we're actually going to walk through how you can do this if you have an open source project that you are currently working on right now. How can you use these tools for free? And I'd love to tell people that. If you don't do CI and CD today, it is actually beneficial for you right now if you want to learn how CI and CD work to use these tools for free. Create a small little sample project and go ahead and walk through what it actually looks like. And once you get used to that flow, then you can start having honest conversations internally about what tooling would we need on premise to be able to do the same things, or how do we roll more of our workloads from on premise into the cloud to be able to enable some of these technologies. So my name is Lee Faust. Um, I am a senior solutions architect at GitHub. My role and responsibility is basically to work with some of our largest customers to basically have the exact same talk that we're going to have right now. Um, a lot of them are struggling. They're trying to figure out how do we move faster? How do we get our developers more engaged? How do we collaborate with the folks both that are employees, with contractors, with subcontractors? How do we get everybody on the same page? So I've been doing this for over 20 years. I was a high school teacher for two years down at Athens Drive, right down the road. Um, I was an adjunct at uh, NC State. I worked, this is my fifth startup at GitHub, if you want to call GitHub a startup. Um, so as we go through this talk, I'm going to be taking a lot of the learnings that I've done. One of the largest projects I worked on um, was about five years ago. I worked for a very large insurance company, and I went in and helped them basically do exactly what I'm going to show you today. And I'm telling you, it doesn't come cheap. This is not one of those things, even though we say it's free, there are tooling that enables you to be able to do some of these things for free, but if you want to roll this out enterprise-wide through your organization, it is an expensive proposition, not for the products that are required, but because of the cultural change you have to institute in the day-to-day -day work. So number one, this is probably the hardest part, and this is process. Currently, most of our development processes are broken. And we think that they're working OK because we release. We can release, and we feel pretty good. And when we release, it maybe goes out with only one or two major blockers. But the customers seem happy. But when you actually go out, if you have the opportunity to interview the business owner, the business owner isn't happy with the functionality. They're happy that you just released something. So both of you are at least on the same page. They're happy you release something. and you're happy that you release something. What happens is, is the communication that we have doesn't go all the way through, and we engage a lot of the business owners the Friday before the release takes place. Hey, user acceptance testing, I'm going to give it to you on Thursday, but we're going live on Saturday. So don't tell me anything's wrong, because I have to go live on Saturday. So one of the things that we currently do in a traditional capital A Agile model is we create a model where the, it's project manager driven. And when it's project manager driven, what we do is we go ahead and we sit in a room at the beginning of a sprint, whether you define your sprints as um, two weeks or three weeks or maybe four weeks, I hope not. Um, but when you define that sprint, everybody gets together and we all collaborate and we sit there and we talk about what we're going to build over the next period of time. And when we discuss what we're going to build, we go through and we start estimating. And we have these really cool things like story poker and we create these because developers are notoriously bad at estimating how long it takes to build something. We've created these things called story points. 
which nobody really knows what a story point is because you go in and say it's three points and the project manager goes, but how long? No, it's three points. No, but how long? So what we do is we end up creating these averages and we create these story points and then what we try to do is one of the things that we don't realize is one team that's a really high performing team that is just killing it. They're ma marking something as a story point of a two or a story point as a three. And then you have another team that's really just kind of getting up to speed and they're maybe learning a new technology and their three is not equivalent to the other three. And you move project managers between and they're like, oh, three, geez, we'll be done by Friday. Well, no, this is a three to us is three sprints. So, um, as we go through and we do sprint planning, the unfortunate thing that we do to the developer is as soon as we are done doing our estimating, we turn around and we put the developer on an island. And what I mean by that is we go ahead and say, here's the branch for the sprint in SVN or inside of CVS. And when we go ahead and we create that branch and they go off and they start doing their work, they don't get any feedback. They go ahead, they do all of their work, they do a whole bunch of commits and then what we do is maybe it's a Friday afternoon, maybe it's the end of a sprint cycle. What we do is we do a code review. And we sit everybody in a room on a Friday afternoon, right as everybody's trying to figure out, my wife told me I need to pick up uh, extra hamburgers for tailgating tomorrow. And, oh wait, what was that? The array was what? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so, so we're usually checked out in that code review. And it's nothing that is, it's against the developers, it's that, Trying to put all of that and back-ending that process, what we end up doing is we end up creating a bottleneck for the release. So now what we do is we have a very subjective go, no go. So the project manager at the end of the code review goes, so what do all the developers think? What do you think? Can we go, should we go forward? Should we move from dev to QA? Yeah, go ahead. We'll see if QA finds any bugs. Go ahead, throw it off to them. So then it goes off to QA and QA goes out and they go ahead and they do the test and they're like, geez, this thing's riddled with bugs. We found 100 more bugs than we found the last sprint that you guys had. Well, how much code did you add? So then what we end up doing is there's another subjective go, no go. And everything's done in these little silos. So the developers had their silo go, no go. QA now has their silo go, no go. And then what we do is we're like, the project manager's like, could you do me a favor? Look, I really need to go live. Um, could we take those 10 blockers and... I don't know if they're really all blockers. You know, these eight, maybe they're a SEV one, but maybe they're not a blocker. So now we go ahead and say, oh, we're, we're at two now. So I think we're okay at two. We can go live with two blockers. So then you send it off to UAT. So now we're at the very end of the process. We create another silo of go, no go decisions with the business owners. And the business owners, if they sit there and they're like, wait, wait a second. We told you that all the buttons were supposed to be blue. Why are they all green? Well, that's how we require, that's how, how the specs came in. Well, we're not going live with all of them that color. You've got to change it. Well, it's Thursday and a lot of the developers have code reviews tomorrow afternoon and getting somebody to work on that and scheduling that in. Can't we just go live this time? And what we'll do is we'll schedule in the next sprint. We'll change the color for you. And then usually you have another subjective go, no go. And usually the business owner is like, well, at least we're getting the functionality that the users want, but it's, does the colors look horrible, but that's fine, we'll just go. So we create all these different silos of go, no go dis, um, discussions, and the collaboration is not all inclusive. And what you end up doing is the project manager, nothing against project managers, they end up creating and taking notes all the way through the process. And you know where their notes go? In the email. And their emails go to their boss. And then what happens is, is nobody learns from all these go, no-go dis discussions with the business owners, with QA. What things are they happy about? What aren't they happy about? What thing, where are things living? What things could we do to reuse things? So as we go through this process, one of the things that we talk about with GitHub is how do we change this process? How do we get people to be more inclusive? How do we reduce the number of environments that we have to deploy to? So we also know that as we go through this process that a lot of the things that we could do that we could automate the process end up becoming scheduled. So when I want to do a CI build, my CI build happens every hour. Maybe it happens once a day. Maybe it happens over the weekend. Is that really doing what you want CI to do? 
Or do you want CI to try to find bugs and try to find things on your behalf? Well, if you really want to do that, then when should we be running CI? CI should be happening immediately when that commit takes place. Let a developer immediately know, hey, JS Lint just came in and told me I'm using tabs instead of spaces. Got to go back in, got to change my editor. Great. At least I know now. I would rather find that out now than find it at the end of the cycle. So the other thing that we schedule is we schedule our releases. Why do we schedule releases? What are we afraid of? If you know and you've got CI and you've got all these other things in place, why not just release when it's done? Why not go through and have UAT when you're going ahead and have the business owners and say, hey, look, we've got a server running that's in quote unquote stage. All you have to do is hit this big happy green button that says go live and we'll just flip the virtual IPs between the two servers and all of your changes are ready to go. Wow, really, we can do that? Yes, we can do that. The technology's there. The capabilities are there. So with GitHub, what we do is we try to change the conversation. We know that people are trying to do a transformation. They're trying to go to Agile. Now what we do is the process at the beginning isn't going to change. We still need to figure out what we're going to build for some set period of time. Now, one of the things that we do is the developer will start off on the island. But what they do is the goal is to have them write maybe two or three lines of code, maybe a unit test. Maybe it's some documentation about what they think they're going to build. And then what we do is we issue a pull request. And that pull request should be opened as soon as possible inside the process. When we open up that pull request very early on, I can hook in Travis CI, Jenkins, Code Climate, um, Heroku, uh, Cloud Foundry. I can plug all of these things into a pull request and start checking to see how things are going. And as soon as I get a good status and it looks like things are good at this point in time, I'll just go ahead and deploy it for you. I don't need somebody to come over and say, hey, are you ready to go live? I just do it. And what's even better is I could have a bot do it on my behalf and let me know when it's completed and put it into a chat room and say, deployment done, we're all good. So as we go through this pull request, one of the things that I encourage my um, companies that I go and talk to is that pull request should be the place for all documentation for that feature. So guess where I do UAT? I do a UAT in that pull request. I do QA out of the pull request. I can cross-link from um, GitHub to Asana to Jira to Track to whatever you want to use for your, ticket for your ticket tracking, and I can plug those in and just do a cross-link between them out of that pull request. I'm sorry, we have 14 blockers that still need to be resolved before we can go live. Great. Let me go ahead and let me start crossing those off as I start doing them through checkboxes inside of a pull request. If you don't know how to do that, come back this afternoon. I'll show you how to do that with GitHub 101. Um, so as we go through this cycle, this becomes a, a repeatable process that we can do over and over again. And one of the things that we find is companies that use a pull request that if you get a developer to open a pull request early in the process, they're hooked on the process. And it's kind of counterintuitive. We've always thought that developers want to go off in the corner underneath a flickering light, don't bother me, I've got code to do, leave me alone. And that's not the way that a lot of developers work today. Developers need feedback from those that they are working with, both their peers, both from the project manager, from the business owners, from QA. And the sooner that we get them engaged with the developer, the sooner that we can get the problems resolved. Now, this is another very important fact. This is actually something that really um, stood out to me when I started working at GitHub. Pull requests don't always have to be merged. You could go through an entire pull request process, and you could go through that process and come back and say, we're just not ready for this feature yet. I can close the pull request and just leave it alone. It doesn't mean that the code goes away. It doesn't mean that the branch has to go away. It just now we have a place for the entire conversation about why or why not did we go live with that particular set of functionality. So when we go through that, that can also assist in continuous delivery. So one of the things that I have a, a really hard time getting across to people is they think that a pull request I have to deploy on every commit. 
I'm like, I really want CI to run on every commit, but I don't necessarily need to deploy. But it would be great if I had an option to deploy if I got to a certain point and say, I'd really like to see how the website looks right now, but I don't have to do it every time. The place where I should be deploying every time is on a merge back into master. And when a deployment happens back into master and that merge takes place, as soon as my deployment goes live, I should tag it. I tag it, I create a release. Now I have something, if you work in a financial industry or if you work in the healthcare industry, you now have a point that you could go back at a specific instance in time and say, what did the code look like now? A lot of people try to create long running branches to be able to solve some of these problems. And what happens is, is I think it's a carryover from subversion that they realize that a tag is an entire copy of that entire file system. And they're like, geez, if we want to do constant tagging, we're going to create a ton of copies of our code. I don't want to do that. Well, in GitHub, it's not a copy. A tag is just a pointer at that specific code at that instance in time. So it makes things a lot easier to be able to work with. Now, if I go ahead and I do this and I've got my pull request where the entire conversation with the entire company is taking place, my master now becomes my clean location for me to deploy off of. And when I'm deploying off of master, it's a point that I can go ahead. One of the things that um, I do when I give DevOps workshops is I talk about being able to break things up into smaller pieces when we're talking about using things like Ansible or we're using things like Chef or Puppet and being able to actually store that with your code. Imagine having the configuration for your application with the code that the application is actually being deployed. So how many people here use GitHub Pages? Anybody here use GitHub Pages? Wow, great. So GitHub Pages, if you've ever looked at that off of your application, it's a great place to put some quick documentation about what you built. The other thing is, is that is actually what we call an orphan branch. So you could do the exact same thing with GitHub uh, pages. You could do the same thing with all of your configuration management. So it could live in the exact same repo as an orphan branch. So that is how I go ahead and then I trigger my deploy to production. So what does this actually look like? So I will admit I've cheated. I've kind of staged some stuff on my machine. So the tools that we see a lot of the open source communities actually um, where they're kind of starting from is number one, the place where they're building the software is on GitHub. If they weren't, I probably wouldn't be up front here speaking to you. Now, one of the things that I did is I actually wrote some bad code, which I am actually really good at. So what I did is I went in and I wrote um, some bad code. And you can see here on the right-hand side, notice that I had a broken test and there's no red X off to the right of it. What happened was is my CI, it had no idea what to do. Even though it was hooked up, it wasn't doing anything. So inside of GitHub, the way that you can actually see what's going on with the code is you can see on the right-hand side, then I started having Xs. The little red X's actually mean that that commit is broken in CI. Now, I'm using Travis CI. It's hooked up to my repository. And here down at the bottom, you can see here that all checks have failed. Now, when we talk about having a clean master, if you're doing this inside of a small team, most um, uh, open source projects will use a fork and pull method. So you can always keep your repository clean and then you can accept contributions from other people who have forked your repo. If you're in an enterprise, most likely you don't use a fork and pull model. So how do I keep master clean? Well, I'm really happy to announce, those of you that have followed the latest releases on GitHub, that we now have something called protected branches. So right now, because these checks have failed, my merge pull request is grayed out. I cannot merge that until I fix these. So, all of these, um, oops, sorry. So all of these configurations actually take place in GitHub through something called a webhook. And they're really easy. You can build a webhook receiver. It is so simple. It is just a JSON payload. And we have something in the background that runs, and every time certain events take place on GitHub, it'll just send that JSON payload out to another server, and then from that server, you can 
perform some magic on that JSON payload, figure out what's going on. Maybe you run it through CloudBees, maybe you run it through Travis, maybe you write your own little business rules engine on the back end to figure out what you want to do with it. And then there's a status as an API that comes back in to basically set these values. And then through protected branches, you can basically specify which branches and what does the status have to be. So what does this look like on the Travis CI side? So right now inside of Travis, let's see here. So Travis is actually showing me I've got two different branches and this is another thing that you want to keep an eye on. So I've got my master right now is green. That's good. If we've got people committing directly to master and they're breaking master, then we no longer have a clean master. That's not a good idea. So when you do protected branches, one of the great things about protected branches, you can also keep people from doing a force push on the master. So most of the time, master is my long running branch. So that's the place where I want to keep all of the most current code. Now inside of this branch, I have this being a failed build and I can actually see everything that, these are the statuses that it's actually sending back. So I got a PR that failed back and I've got my pull request. There's two events inside of a webhook that Travis CI listens to. One is a, what's called a PR sync event. That PR sync event is any time that that pull request has been changed. So that could be somebody adds a new label to it. That could be somebody created an assignee. That could be somebody went ahead and made a comment to it. That is a pull request sync event. Now the other thing that we have is we also have a push event. So when somebody actually does a git push to that branch that that pull request is wrapping, that will also trigger another build. So if I go and look at another tool that we know a lot of projects are very fond of is something called Code Climate. Code Climate is actually a really cool, quick snapshot of what's going on with your code. So when we sit there and we think about um, technical debt, um, how many people here feel like they're buried in technical debt right now? I know I am. So what technical debt means, for those of you who don't know, technical debt is when you keep adding code after code after code after code. And after a year or two, you've added all of this functionality and you've realized that you've built a whole bunch of individual features, but there's no real flow between all of those features. So users feel like, oh, I've got to now go find this little tile instead of going to my start menu. But if I go to start menu and I want to go see my control panel, I've got to right click on it instead of left clicking on it. So those particular things that you run into is what ends up happening after years and years and years of technical debt. So what Code Climate will do is it allows you to be able to monitor every individual um, at like a class level in Java or a class level in Ruby, um, or you can do it with scripts. Um, they've now open sourced their engine. So they've got a JS lint, they've got an ES lint, um, they have a CSS lint. So you can do a lot of powerful things with um, Code Climate to be able to monitor how well the code is, um, has been written. And then you can also, what they call, what I call technical debt, they call churn. So how often are they, how many new things are being added to these files and how often are they changing? This is actually a really good target. Like I remember one of the things, if, for those of you that maybe go back early on in Java, when we used to have a struts config file, and that struts config file, you couldn't have many struts config files. You had one. And that struts config file would end up being 10,000 lines long. And everybody who wanted to create a new controller had to go in and actually had to go in and modify that one file. So that file would have a ton of churn on it. So what we end up doing is we can start targeting and finding things that are unwieldy. It's really hard to modify a 10,000 line file. So maybe it's time that I'm looking at the churn on that. Maybe there's a way for me to be able to break that up into smaller files. Now, uh, the other thing that I know we run into when we go out and talk to a lot of organizations is a lot of enterprises want to do what we call inner sourcing. So what they want to do is they want to follow an open source methodology in their enterprise. 
and then they want to take certain projects that they're working on and actually take them from once they've worked on them internally and then open sourcing those ideas and sharing them with people outside of their company. Well, be, not having any metrics about how well the code has been written is not going to get a lot of people coming to your community. When you start using these tools, you can actually take, they actually have little flags. So um, back here, this little build passing, I can actually take that. If you look at different open source projects, you can actually see that little badge, and you can actually put it on your GitHub repository. Um, all of these things that I'm talking about, this is great. Usually, I, this is about the point that I start going, they're like, this is fine, this is great for the open source community, but how do I do this in my enterprise? I want to do this on premise. These ideas, these guys are great. Well, guess what? Travis CI has an enterprise product. You can actually install that on premise. Code Climate has an on premise solution. You can do hybrid solutions with them. So, you can do part of your project internal and part of your projects in the cloud. So when you start talking about how you actually start integrating all these things together, it actually makes it really easy. The last piece that we actually use as part of the integration is a lot of people go to Heroku. Now, Heroku is just a platform as a service. They've got a whole bunch of little widgets that they've defined already for you. They've got a MongoDB widget, a Postgres widget, a RabbitMQ widget, um, a MySQL widget. So you can basically just take those components. And those of you that are currently trying to build out platforms as a service now, or maybe you're trying to move from infrastructure as a service and trying to figure out how to do microservices and plug everything together, this should be the holy grail for you. You want to build something that is just like Heroku. And there's some open source solutions that are out there right now. So you've got things like Cloud Foundry. You've got things like uh, Deus um, from Optiman. So there's companies out there that are doing this in an open source flavor that you can actually take it and consume it and build whatever you need on top of it. So one of the things that I'm going to attempt to do live is I'm going to try to fix my bug. So. This is going to be a lot of code. So right now, I've got an assert, and it was set to false. So I'm going to work really hard here. And I'm going to do a really good unit test. I'm going to save it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in. And of course, I thought I had my tab open. OK. so. Um, yesterday when I was showing, um, doing GitHub 101, so right now I'm in my command line editor and you can see it's under feature sample test is my branch that I'm currently editing under. So what will end up happening is if I do a git status, here it will show me that I've got a file that has been modified. It's in red to show me that it's been changed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a git commit going to do all of them. I could just specify the files that I want. Dash M, fix my bug. OK, so now I've committed it. So now you can see it went from red to green, the branch. That's telling me everything on that branch is it's currently clean. So I don't have anything else on that branch to be able to. And you can go out. Um, and if you want to do this from the command line, you want to learn how to do this, all you have to do is just do a Google search for um, git color bash. And it'll, you can download a bunch of people who have open sourced their little scripts that they used in their bash profile to be able to set these colors. So now what I need to do is I've committed it. So those of you that are in SVN world, it's not on the server yet. It's still on my machine. Okay. So the way that I get it from my machine back onto the servers, I have to push it. So I do a git push. OK. And of course, something failed. I was out of date. <coughs> Tell you what, I'm going to cheat. 
And what I'm going to do is go back into, go to my branch, because it's only one file. edit it here. So I'm going to Okay, so now I've gone ahead and I've got my commit and if I look at my pull request, what we're going to see right now is it's thinking. This is another thing that's really important if you want to do continuous integration. One of the things that you want to do is you don't want a very long build process. You need things to be small, incremental changes, and you also want to be able to have tests that fail quickly. So when you're writing and you're doing TDD, doing BDD, when you're doing these things, you need to make sure that you're doing them very quickly and failing very early. Now, what we should see is a build got kicked off. So currently, this is what we're seeing. Now, one of the things that's actually happening down at the bottom here, we can actually see the worker. It's actually going off. It's doing the stuff. It's going ahead, downloading everything. And hopefully, what will end up happening is my test it will run a rake in the background. Those of you that are Rails, Ruby people, it's going to do a rake in the background. And hopefully, my test succeeds, which should then send a status back into GitHub to actually say that everything is good, which will I kind of got myself stuck because if it doesn't, I can't go to the next step and I have to figure out what happened. Yay, I have no failures. My build exited with a zero. That's good news. So now everything is green. So now I get the big green merge my pull request. And now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to merge and I'm going to say, um, Quick deploy for change. Now, this is one of the things that a lot of people don't know. Remember when we were talking about I have the choice. I don't have to merge it. I could have just made a comment and closed this pull request. And then all the commits, all the changes would have just stayed on that branch. What happens is, is over time, what you could have done is you could go back and use that as documentation. Hey, I remember, yeah. Um, Susan built that really cool thing about three months back and we just closed that pull request. Let me go out and let me do a search through GitHub because I know that Susan's code out there. Oh, you know what, even better yet, let me just at mention Susan in this new pull request and let me get her to go ahead and tell me what she actually did and why we decided not to go live. So now you can actually take those conversations, link those things back and forth between what's going on. So now that I've done a merge and a master, what should have happened is right now, I should, this is now in Heroku, I have this connected to GitHub, again, via webhooks. And what would end up happening is, um, let's see, so it should be deployed. But it did not. I don't have my dynos configured. Oh, I didn't add a proc file. That's my fault. So normally what you'd have to do for Heroku is you have to have something called a proc file that actually describes how many CPUs you want, how much memory do you want, what are the other connectivity options. It's the same thing with any platform as a service. And usually what happens is that proc file actually uses some sort of uh, discovery mechanism. So you might have something um, when, if you guys were in the, yesterday in the keynote and they were talking about um, flannel and talking about etcd, those are places that you could go to go do a lookup for what services exist. Um, there's something called Zookeeper that exists from Apache, another place to be able to do service discovery. Um, with Cloud Foundry, there's, um, they actually have what they call a service broker that actually looks at all the warden containers and actually um, you can use those for service discovery. Inside of um, Heroku, they actually make you spell it out as part of their um, terms and agreements. 
because what they don't want to do is automatically discover something that you don't want and start charging you $80 a month for something you didn't need. So um, now I've got, that kind of walks me through the entire process. Now, one of the things I like to talk about is now that we've gotten to this point is I'm going to go over to here. And I've got a chat application. And everything that we just went through, if we look at the timeline, this is now in chat. It's actually going through in everything that we did. So here I've got my commits. I've got my um, pull request updates. I've actually got a little squirrel here telling that a new deployment took place. So this is something that we refer to as chat ops. So one of the things that you can do is I can actually go in and run an at Hubot Heroku status. And you can see that Hubot responds to me. There is a bot sitting in the background. So there's actually something from GitHub. It's um, a free bot that plugs into pretty much any chat client. It can sit in IRC. It can sit in um, Slack. Um, and it can sit in uh, Rocket Chat, which I found about three months ago. It's an open source chat client written in Meteor, so one of the new cool kids on the block, Meteor. Um, so if you're a JavaScript person, you can go ahead and you can download this, and then they already have a Hubot integration. All of the plugins for Hubot are then written in CoffeeScript. So what you can do with CoffeeScript in the back end is you can both, all the, um, when we look at all the inbound, it actually has a layer that you can actually receive HTTP posts into Hubot, and it'll actually put the um, what came in and actually put it into the chat channel. Or you can go ahead and actually do requests, and it basically looks at regular expressions and will actually go out and do outbound requests on your behalf. So from here, where does this actually take me? Well, when we actually talk about all of these different tools, somebody has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort to make these things really easy for you. So what happens is, is number one, you can't just take your existing COBOL application that's been running on the mainframe for 30 years and just package it up and throw it out into Heroku. That's not the way it works. What needs to happen is, is you need to start thinking about the architecture of your app. And the two best places that, um, when I share my slides out, the two, I've got a link in here to Martin Fowler's microservices um, a discussion, and then also a link to the 12 Factor Apps uh, webpage, which is 12 Factor, the number 12factor.net. Um, both of those are great resources when you're talking about how do I want to build and deliver these applications automatically. It talks about you should be using version control. All of your parameters for like your JDBC strings, everything should be a, like a property that you can then go and read from Chef, from Puppet, from Ansible. Um, and then microservices really is just describing a new way of the way that we've, those of us that have been doing architecture for the last 10 years, it's just a new name for the things that we've been doing. Um, so if you've been doing things and you've been keeping things small, lightweight, componentized applications, now what we're doing is we're just taking those components instead of building them as a war or as an ear. Now what we do is we build them in something called, I don't know, Docker. And now we just deliver them as a Docker image instead of building them as a binary uh, executable. So then for me, where we go from architecture is to DevOps. And for me, DevOps is three things. It's templates, orchestration, and inventory. If you are not doing all three of these, to me, you're not doing DevOps. Most people have everything templatized, whether it be in Bash, whether it be in one of those other frameworks for configuration management. A lot of people are missing orchestration. They'll consider their vSphere, they'll consider vCenter, um, OpenStack, OpenShift. They'll consider that their inventory, which is fine. You know what the name of the VM is, but unless you have a really good naming convention, do you actually know what's running on that VM? Do you know what's running in that Docker container? If I needed to automatically discover and say, find me a MySQL server that has empty table space that is under 5% utilization, could you do that in your organization today? If you can't do that, then your inventory management system's broken. So orchestration is probably the most important piece. And when I saw Jim Whitehurst's little um, infinity symbol, 
of where we go from developer to operations, that continuous discussion communication mechanism, that is where orchestration kicks off. So we need something to trigger the orchestration. There needs to be a starting point. So for us at GitHub, that's a pull request. When you open up a pull request, that starts the orchestration flow. Then what you do is you usually have pipelines to find, and then you have triggers along the way that you may not always want to go live onto a running box. You may need, based on whatever the hierarchy is inside your organization, you may have to get an approval. Well, how could I get an approval? How can I automate that? I could do that in chat ops. I could go ahead and, at Susan, can I get an approval? At Susan, yes. Great, Hubot can watch that conversation and automatically take that trigger and move it from step A to step B. Automatically kick off a new workflow. So then we have to think about breaking these things up into two different sections. A lot of times what we do is we try to deploy everything as one big script, which is just heartbreaking to me because when we talk about that, hey, we finally got dev and operations kind of talking to one another, as developers are trying to break things down into smaller and smaller componentized pieces, operations is trying to figure out how to build longer and longer and longer scripts to be able to deploy everything. So for me, I like to think about breaking it up into two different things. So you have your machine templates, and your machine templates are basically those microservices. This is what I want to be able to discover. And then what happens is I have application templates that understand what services are available, both from a con consumption standpoint as well as from an infrastructure standpoint. So I can actually take this, one of the things that one of our um, engineers at GitHub, uh, Mike McQuaid, one of the things that he actually, uh, he coined the term, and I don't know if it was him or if he read it from somebody else, called runnable documentation. And I love that concept. I love the idea of having a repository inside of GitHub for my organization underneath an ops organization, one repository called runnable documentation. This is where all of my scripts would live. And they might live in different branches for different environments. There's all kinds of different ways of being able to handle that. And then what we do is inside an application template, this is where we could use an orphan branch. And then what we can do is we can define what the things are that are on top of the machine templates that allows us to be able to go live. So just to be able to reiterate, so we have chat ops, which can then take us in between those different segments. So when I've got machine templates and I go ahead and I have my application templates, I'm triggering the workflow. How do I go in between states? If you're not at the point yet to be able to go all the way from beginning to end, this is a really good meet in the middle. I really don't like the idea of getting approvals through email, um, usually because my email's already full, and most likely I'm gonna miss it, and somebody's gonna go, why didn't we go live on Saturday? How did you tell me we were supposed to go live? I, I sent you an email. Yeah, I missed the email. So having it where a number of different people are all watching, um, that you can also do your deployments by team, so one of the things, just like in GitHub, we've now moved uh, to an org permission model. So you should do the same thing for your DevOps teams. So what happens is, is if you're in chat ops, you can sit there and say, anybody who is a member, maybe it's a member of a channel, and you have to be invited to the channel, then anybody inside that channel could say, at Hubot, deploy production, give the name of a branch, or give the name of a repo. And then what happens is, it'll just create a release, tag it, and go ahead and move it forward. So all kinds of different ways. It's completely configurable. Rocket Chat is open source. Hubot is open source. You can take them, consume them, break them apart, do whatever you want to do with them. So that leads us to the last part, which is delivery. Now, one of the last pieces that a lot of people forget is they think once they've released, they're done. Um, one of the things that we do at GitHub that I really like is anytime we go and we get ready to release a new version of our application, what we do is we actually have checkboxes. So inside of Markdown, you can do a dash and then a left bracket and then a right bracket and put a space in between in an issue. And what it does is it creates little checkboxes. And what we do is we have little links to an issue for marketing, an issue for the web team, an issue for support. And what happens is we track everything through cross links and they all come back into GitHub that we know that this particular issue is our release documentation. 
This is how we determine that we're ready to go live. When everybody has checked off their boxes, then we are ready to go live. Until you get to that point, usually it will sit in a staging area. So delivery for me, that last step is just flipping a virtual IP between two boxes, between two IP addresses. And that is what delivery, your final delivery should look like. We do that inside of GitHub. Um, I've done that for other customers in the past and it works really, really well. So that's it. Um, here I'll be able to take any questions. So thank you very much.